Good morning, good morning, everybody. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. If you're visiting with us today, you make our service special. We're delighted to have you. Maybe you need to turn me up, Tim. On the handheld. Different mic than I normally start off with. How about that? You hear me now? It's good to see you this morning. We're delighted that you're here for our first day of revival. So good to have the Reeds with us, Jeremy and Jana. Bailey and Lexi, they're no strangers to us. They served well here with us many years, and now they're working in the Mobile Area Destination Church and doing so many things for the Lord. I'll be saying more about them in just a few moments. Let me just remind you of our service tonight at 6 o'clock. Patrick and Trista Cooper and the Chosen Worship Team will be with us, so be sure and be here with us for this service tonight. And then, ladies, you have a a meeting next Saturday at 1 o'clock. It is a... uh, comfort food I'm to understand uh, that you bring with you so whatever makes you comfortable uh, whether it's bonbons or whatever uh, just uh, bring your comfort foods and uh, and come and be at your meeting next week Brother Richard's going to come and open our service I'm excited about revival how about you amen I'm excited we have our vessels here that we've emptied out and we're ready for them to be filled this morning good morning The Bible tells us in Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 5, it says, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one another of one another. And then over in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 says, And let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to work good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. I may be preaching to the choir here this morning, but the Bible's clear that the best place for us to thrive is in the community of believers. The Bible teaches us we need one another. We're joined together as a body of Christ and is made to function as one, both for our edification and the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose here on this world. And in order to make the soul of our hearts soft and receptive to God, we must have the help of those who God has placed around us. We're created to worship with the body of Christ for all eternity, and all eternity includes right now, this day. The church may not be perfect, But she is God's bride. And his desire for his people is to gather, and he loves to pour out his presence in unique and specific ways when we gather together. There's edification you need that can only take place in the presence of other believers. There's blessings that only can be received when you open your heart to the family of God. We all have wounds, we all need grace. And we all need each other. The very person who most annoys you may need you the most. Just as you need those or that what fellow worshipers around you have to offer you, others need who God has created you to be. 
God's desire for the church is vast and powerful. He has loved his people in perfect faithfulness, despite our transgressions and wonderings. When we fail to show grace and love to those around us, we fail to live out God's heart for his people. One day we'll all be made perfect and able to worship face to face with our loving, living God. Hallelujah. One day every tribe, tongue, and nation will declare together the wonders of God's amazing love. We need to live in the light of eternity today. And if we worship here today as we will in heaven, we can watch heaven invade earth around us with his glory and his love. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this day and thank you for the opportunity again, God, to join together to praise you and worship you, Father. We thank you for the word that's going to come forth here this day, Father, and anointing you placed upon Jeremy, Lord God. We thank you for that anointing, that calling in his life, God. And Father God, right now we ask that anointing that you're placed upon him come forth with authority, Father God, and power, Lord, as it's here to change our lives, Father. As your word is spoken, God, it will change our lives. Father, we lift up the worship service of this, Father, and we just ask you that you would come and have it to praise your people this day. In Jesus' name, amen.
setting us free from the bondage of sin. You know, I was listening to Brother Kevin Ham this morning. You may or may not have heard him. He was talking about when we receive salvation, when he comes into our life, he changed. We're a new person. We're not the old person that we used to be. And that we have to change. Our life is not the same. But apparently, if we look at how, how society is going now, we, as the church, have allowed the enemy, the devil, to back us into a corner. See, what things that are allowed today compared to things that are not allowed. We need to stand up as a church, as Christians, if we really think it, and declare his name, and not be silent, because we've been silent too long. The enemy is back to south. The Ten Commandments can't be displayed, but what can be displayed? It's easy to see, but we need to declare his name. We do not need to be ashamed of who he is or who we are. We need to let the world know there is no other. If you love him, lift your hands and praise. If you love him, stand with us today. If you love him, lift your voice and shout the glory of his name. If you love him, open up your mouth. If you love him, let his praise ring out. Every nation. Sing for joy and come together. Our God is strong and mighty. We will not be silent. We will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other. We are not ashamed. We will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other. Jesus, we declare your name. your hands in praise if you love him stand with us today if you love him lift your voice and shout the glory of his name if you love him open up your mouth if you love him let his praise ring out every nation sing for joy and come together our God is strong and mighty we will not be silent we will declare your name we will declare your name and we will tell the world there is no other we are not ashamed we will declare your name. We will declare your name. And we will tell the world there is no other. Jesus, we declare your name. We will declare your name. We will declare. Tell the world there is no other. We are not ashamed. We will be. 
so I've come to tell you he's alive to tell you that he drives every tear that falls so I've come to tell you that he saves to shout and to proclaim that he's coming back for you Cause he Because he lives So I've come To tell you he's alive To tell you that he drives Every tear that falls Tell you that he saves to shout and to proclaim that he's coming back for you. So I've come to tell you he's alive. Thank you, Jesus. Give him praise.
How about that? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Man, you're worshiping so beautifully this morning. It is indeed an honor to have Jeremy and Jana, Bailey and Lexi with us. They're no strangers. They may be to some of you because you come along after they had moved on about 15 years ago now, I think, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, but uh, they have always been like family to us. Uh, Jana goes all the way back to the Joy Bells and the Blue Bells at the Adamsville Church. Been knowing her that long and then been knowing Jeremy for quite a while as a group of young guys that used to come and meet at the Adamsville Church and pray. Uh, that's where uh, I got to know them, young guys and young girls that came. We had prayer meetings a, a lot of nights. They let me hang around as an old man with them, and I enjoyed that. But it is a delight for them to be here. I want to ask our ushers to come, and I want to give you an opportunity to bless them with an offering. As I said, Jeremy is the associate pastor at the Destination Church in Mobile, but he also does a tremendous amount of missions work. Already this year, he'll be going to Honduras with Angie, where we support. He'll be going to Montana, where we support. Uh, he'll be going to uh, Africa and uh, uh, then in, into Greece and some places like that. He's going to a lot of places this year, and uh, we want to help be a part of their ministry and what they're doing and all the things that they're doing. So uh, I, I want you to bless them. Uh, today. Father, we love you. Thank you for choice servants of God that have committed their lives, God, to following you. And Lord, I just pray that in everything that they do, that you would continue to bless them abundantly. You've moved so greatly in their lives. And Lord, we have an opportunity now to be a part of that ministry. And I, I pray for your people as they give right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to sit down here and let Jeremy have the service, but uh, I do love this young man. He's not young anymore, but neither am I. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I do love him, and I love the Jan and the girls. So, but. Uh, I want to. I want to start by saying this. I, I really. I always think about this when I have the opportunity to be able to speak. I've been. Uh, this was technically the first church that we were really a part of in, in ministry. And I have, we've slowly moved south over the last 20 years. We're about peaked out as far as we can go, as far as south goes, and, and stay inside of the state. I've had three pastors in my life that made an impact in different ways on me. And I think about this all the time. This didn't just come up because of coming here this weekend. I had a, I had a pastor at a church that, the church that I left here to go to originally in the Millbrook, Prattville area. He was an incredible businessman. He, I learned so much from him when it came to the art of finances and just how to take care of things and that nature. And I'm serving with a pastor right now that is just a people person. He just has the ability. He's just charismatic, and people are just drawn to him, his personality. But this man right here, being here for the five or six years that we were here, was one of the most caring people that I've ever met in my life. His desire to just take care of people 
and love people, I'll never forget it. I'll, it, it. It'll stick with me for the rest of my life because I saw him. And it's hard sometimes in ministry to care for people. Some people make it really hard to care for them. But I watched him take care of people and just genuinely have concern. And so I contribute. I, I wish I had a little more of that in me. I don't possess a whole lot of that. <laughs> I love people, but um, I also love it when they do what they're supposed to do. <laughs> but um, it, it is, it's, it's great to be here. I'm excited for the opportunity to be here. Um, my wife and I are going to have a small fight right now that I have a microphone, so she can't really fight back. Um, I know for a fact that this is 20 years since we were hired to come here as student pastors. We came in 2003. I know we did. I know we did. You don't have a mic, so you can't fight me right now. She says that it was 2004. It was 2003. So for me, even if it's not, you know what, it's incredible for me to be able to be back here and to be a part of uh, these services with you guys. I want to I want to speak to you this morning for just a little while on a topic of the power of the second question. Can I, uh, I have a really bad ring up here right now. It's a, uh, um, Mark chapter 8, which is what I'm going to go to, going to be my main verse for this, uh, verses 27 through 29. Mark chapter 8, though, recalls for us a couple of major miracles that Jesus performed. I'll take your handheld mic if you want me to. It's fine. There we go. Well, there we go. Uh, we find these miracles. We find Jesus, and these are, these are miracles that we, we know all about. We've read, we've heard about. Jesus feeds the 4,000 people with seven loaves and just a few small fish after blessing it. <clears throat> Not only does he feed the multitude with this, but also the fragments that remain, the disciples filled up seven large baskets. Just moments later, we read of Jesus spitting into the eyes of a blind man, laying his hands on him, and the man regaining his sight. And then we get to the passage that I really want to focus on uh, for this word this morning. In verse 27 through 29, it says, Jesus went out along with his disciples and he went to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, the disciples answered him, saying, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, but others, one of the prophets. Jesus could have stopped right there and not went any further, just wanting to know what other people were saying about them, but it says that he continued by questioning them again. He said, but who do you say that I am? And immediately we get a response from Peter, and he says, Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Can I pray real quick? Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that it tells us that it is sharper. It's more powerful than any two-edged sword, God, that it pierces separates God even bone from marrow it can separate everything inside of us God it it can dig deep into the dark places of our lives God and do what only it can do and father I pray this morning that your word would go forward that you would pierce our hearts God that we would be challenged not to be better than anyone else God but to just be a better version of us today than we were yesterday Help us to be who you've called us to be through your word, Father. Let it speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe the first question introduced to the disciples was simply a setup. I don't really believe that Jesus was concerned with what other people were saying about him. When he asked the question to them, who do people say that I am? Jesus knew what people were saying about him. The disciples at this time, they were not going to surprise him with some new comparison 
that people had associated Jesus with. They weren't going to catch him off guard with some new criticism about where he came from or about uh, who he was or about the fact that he was the son of a carpenter. He wasn't going to be concerned with the fact of the questions that came from. He came from Nazareth. You know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? This is who we've been waiting for. We've been waiting for the son of a carpenter. None of those things were going to catch him off guard. I believe Jesus knew that 2,000 plus years ago, the same thing that still rings true for us today. People are messy. People are just messy. And the reality of those messes are is that messes come in all shapes and sizes. Anybody in here know somebody that's messy? All right? If you don't, it's because it's you. Let's just go ahead and get that out there, out of the way right now. We know people that just love to insert their opinion into things all of the time and whether the opinion's right or wrong. I believe that this is the motive that Jesus had when he asked the disciples in this moment, who do people say that I am? Because Jesus is dealing at this time with, with 12 young guys that are, are you know, they, they've, they've been consumed in their lives. No, they're, they're not followers of of him up to the point when they met him these guys were rough they came off of the streets they came off of fishing boats they they came out of uh, of of different jobs that um, did not have the best light surrounding them and he knew that their lives had been consumed with hearing through the Jewish culture of what Jesus coming, what the Son of God that was going to come into the world, what he was supposed to look like, what he was supposed to do. Let me tell you how incredible this is, that it, 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 was, it was so bad that even the cousin of Jesus, John the Baptist, he was coming in and he was telling of the way that Jesus was going to come, and his was completely wrong. He was telling people, he's going to come into the earth and he's going to have his winnowing fork in hand and he's going to separate the wheat from the tares and he's going to burn up and he's going to do all these things and he's going to bring judgment. And Jesus was like, that's not what I'm doing. I didn't come to do all of these things. So at this point, Jesus is really fishing with the disciples and he's trying to figure out what people are saying. He wants to know. He is questioning them because of it. He wants to get an idea because these disciples at this time, you know, we just talked about it. He's been feeding the multitudes with, with just a few fish and, and all these questions are coming up and Jesus has got the disciples and they're walking around and they're feeding these people and they're separating it, people into groups and they're hearing all these different conversations of what all of these people are saying about it. And I believe that essentially what's taking place in the moment is all the disciples are coming back together now and he wants to hear the voices that are speaking into their ears. He wants to know, what are you hearing from other people? But not, what are you hearing because I'm concerned about what their voices are saying. But I want to know if the voices that are speaking to you right now, are they louder than the voice that I'm speaking to you? When you're hearing the voices of these people and they're telling and they're saying the things that they're saying about me, are they overriding the things that I'm telling you? Because they didn't have the luxury of having this book right here. They were living this book while it was happening. They couldn't go back to a scripture and Jesus just go, just go, just flip back, just flip back to Matthew. They're living Matthew. They didn't have the luxury of being able to look and go, well, let me tell you what Paul's going to... Paul wasn't even existing at this time in this book. So Jesus is wanting to find out. He's, he's trying to see now. I want to dissect what people are speaking into you so I can figure out if the voices that you're hearing on the outside are becoming louder than the voice that I'm placing inside of you in this moment. There were people that were there in these moments... Uh, when Jesus is feeding the multitude that they're there simply just to disrupt what's happening they're there to try and infect others with false truths and rumors and things that are just simply meant to cause confusion does that not sound like the world that we live in today 
It's, it's an exact replica of what we're living in. There's nothing new today. Exactly what we're facing today is what they faced 2,000 years ago. We just face it in a little different way. It's a little bit louder today because social media didn't exist for things to be able to get out there. You've got to be careful what you do and what you say today. Because before you can get it out of your mouth, it's already out there. And, and, and no, those things didn't exist, but word spread. So Jesus is simply fishing now, trying to figure out what's being force-fed to those that he cared about, those people that he had called to carry the gospel after he was going to physically exit from the earth. See, I believe that the second question that Jesus asked was the only one that he really cared about about getting a true answer to. He knew the opinions in the crowd would be many. Some would be right. Probably most would be wrong. The second question is the one that every person in this building right now needs to be able to answer with confidence. You need to be able to answer with 100% confidence in your heart of what the answer is because the second question is all that really answer uh, all that really matters because the second question can't be answered by someone else for you the second question the answer to it cannot be answered by the opinions of a pastor that stands on a stage and preaches to you. It can't be answered by the opinions of a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister or a relative or a best friend. The second question can only be truly answered through personal experience, through personal life change, through one-on-one conversations with the Father, through a midnight hour of prayer and a moment of desperation. The second question makes the first question completely irrelevant when you've been alone with God because the second question can't be rehearsed when you've had a real life experience in the presence of an almighty God the second question is the easiest and the most difficult to answer why Because the answer changes every single day as I need him differently. Every day the answer changes. And this is why when Moses is confronted with the task of leading the children of Israel out of bondage from the Egyptian slavery, and and, and and Moses having a question, uh, Moses asked question, uh, God a question, out through a burning bush and he goes listen I know you're sending me in I know that you want me to go and do these things and he says but who am I supposed to tell people who am I supposed to say sent me to do this God didn't say tell them God sent you because there were many gods he didn't say tell them that Jehovah sent you he said you tell them that I am sent you can you imagine the confusion on the face of Moses to hear those two words tell them I am God how does this even make sense you want me to explain you in two words and it's really simple and it's really difficult at the same time and I know you've heard it before Hundreds of times if you've sat in services and listened to somebody speak or you've read it for yourself. God could not back himself into a corner with an answer. He couldn't say tell them that the person that's going to deliver them sent them because they would only have ever looked as God as a deliverer. He said you tell them that I am sent them because I am fill in the blank. I am whatever. I am whoever. I'm whatever you need whenever you need it. If he would have given them one answer, they would have only ever known God as one thing. But God said, you tell them that I am sent them because I want them to know that wherever they find themselves in life, 
whatever corner they find themselves backed into, whatever sickness comes upon their bodies, whatever disease they find themselves afflicted with, whenever they get into a financial crisis in their lives, whenever they find themselves standing in front of a doctor and he can't give the answer to what they're dealing with, you let them know that I am whatever they need. I am healer. I am the financial deliverer. I am the physical deliverer. I can bring healing when healing needs to come. But I can also be the friend that sticks closer than a brother. The second question Jesus asked them, he said, But who do you say that I am? See, this is why the first question was irrelevant. It was really just a conversation starter. Because he used the first question to see how they would answer the second one. Well, when I ask them the second one, are they going to go off the opinions of the first question they answered? Are they going to use that to form their opinions of who I am in their life? He was saying to them, now that I know what you're hearing from the outside world, does this change what you personally think about who I am? So I want to ask you, who's bad experience in a church? Whose bad experience with a pastor or the member of a church have allowed you to have a misconception of who God is? What relative in your family has allowed you to have a misconception of who God is because someone said something that they maybe should not have said? Did something that they shouldn't have done? Hurt your feelings? Can I? All right, she gets on to me sometimes. I'm probably a little too real at some point, and I know that I am, but this is the only way that I know to be. At some point in our lives, we have to grow up. At some point in our lives, we have to get to the point that not every person that opens their mouth hurts my feelings. Your opinion of who God is does not sway my opinion one bit. It doesn't change anything about me. It doesn't not make me want to go to church, but it doesn't want to make me go any more than I already go. I do the things that I do because I've been alone with Him. I've had a relationship with him, and I've seen him. He's he's talked to me when nobody else would talk to me. He gave me answers when nobody else had an answer. He showed up with the answer. I don't need your opinion to love God anymore. I don't have to have your opinion to be in love with him anymore. I, I value the opinions of, of people on, on a lot of things in my life. I have people that I value their opinions of politics, right or wrong, whether you like to talk about it or not. I value the opinions of, of certain people in my life. You can, you can come and explain to me why you're a Ford or a Chevy man. That, you know, that's an opinion. If you, if you want to do it, that's fine. You can talk about it. You can, you can try to explain to me your thought on what the rapture is going to look like. You can give me your opinion on whether or not you're pre, mid, or post-trib. All right, we can talk about those, all those things. But when it comes to God, when it comes to who He is, when it comes to what He's done for me, your opinions don't matter. It does not fluctuate mine. It does not change mine. And, you know, some people can, can hear that and then go, well, you know, that's being really small-minded. And maybe it is being small-minded. But let me tell you what I know about being small-minded. I remember, I remember sitting in a church in Birmingham when I was about 18 years old. And I remember sitting there on the front row and I remember listening to a pastor get up and preach a message and having an altar call. And I remember hearing, sitting there with my heart about to beat out of my chest. I remember 
walking down to an altar. Didn't, I didn't have to go but about eight or ten feet. I remember walking down to that altar and I, I got down on my knees in front of that altar and I remember kneeling down right there and I remember, I remember God speaking into me in that moment. And it doesn't make sense to anybody else because you weren't there with me. But I remember him telling me that if you'll just give your life to me, if you'll just sacrifice, if you'll, if you'll make some sacrifices in your life, I'll use you to do things that you won't believe that I can use you to do if you'll just simply do it. Just like me, for you right now, I wasn't there when God called you out of your mess. I wasn't there when God brought you out of everything that God brought you out of. Can I tell you something? We should not dwell on the past in our lives. Because the only thing that lives in the past is our enemy. It's the only thing. This is why Paul said, I forget about the things that are behind me. Because if I look at the things behind me, all I'm ever going to be reminded of is my failures. But can I also tell you that I can't forget where I came from? I can't, I have to remind myself sometimes. I don't have it all together. There are days when I feel like that I, I'm the greatest version of me that I've ever been. And there are days where I think to myself, God, why don't you just strike me dead right now? I have to be reminded sometimes of of what God had to rescue me out of to get me to the place that I am right now. If you would have come to me when I was 18 years old and said, Jeremy, you're going to stand on a stage one day in, in Uganda and you're going to preach to, to 4,000 people sitting inside of a church service with a, somebody that's going to sit there and interpret for you and you're going to walk and you're going to watch hundreds of people walk down to an altar and give their life to God at the same time. You're going you're gonna to walk on on all different continents all over this world. You're going to travel from one end of this world to the other and be able to preach the gospel. If you'd have told me that, I would have told you that you had something wrong with you. If you would have told me that God could have rescued me out of the things that, that I was living in and the things that I had going on in my life and I could get to the place where I'd even be able to stand and say a word out of this book right here, I would have told you that you were a liar. Because there was a time in my life that all I lived off of was the opinions of the first question. But I started formulating the answers to the second question for myself. And when God began to reveal himself to me, it didn't matter what anybody else said anymore. Because see, I, and I've been at the place in my life where I needed God to do things that there's not a person on this planet could have done. There's not a person on earth could have ever done the things that I was asking God to do. I remember one time, maybe, I, I, it may have been before we moved here, I can't remember. I remember one time my wife, she, had a, she was having some issues with her heart. And we went to the hospital and I, I don't... If I butcher the story, you can tell me I did later. But didn't know what was going on. My wife's a worrier. Just, just can't help it. It's just what she does. And I remember going to the, she had a doctor's appointment. And they were going to do tests on her, try to figure out what was going on. And I remember sitting in the waiting room. And I had my Dakes Bible. 
And I remember sitting there and the waiting room was packed. She's gone back for her tests. It was going to be a couple of hours. While I was sitting there, all of a sudden, Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, I want you to get on your knees right here in this waiting room and I want you to pray for her. And I said, not a chance, God. (laughs) I mean, this place was packed. And I sat there for five minutes and man, the Holy Spirit just, I mean, I'm sweating now. I'm getting nauseous. I I just, I can feel it. And I'm like, God, you're not going to stop until I do this. And I, I slide real easy out to the edge of my chair and I'm looking around. I'm like, please, God, don't let anybody be looking at me when I do this because they're going to think that something's wrong with me. And as fast as I could, I slipped out of that chair, spun around, and I knelt down in front of that chair, put my face on top of that Bible, and I started praying. A little while later, they come out and, you know, they they asked for us, the family that was there. Doctor comes over and he starts talking to us and he said, well, I've, I've, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. And, you know, in my heart just just sank he said the good news is we can't find anything wrong and before he could say the bad news is I said there is no bad news because the bad news was we can't find anything wrong and I remember in that moment thinking to myself God you really are healer you really are a healer I remember the night that we got called or the day that we got called to the hospital when my mother-in-law with cancer the worst possible thing that could have happened in the moment died at her desk in her office and I remember praying and believing that God was going to heal her body and she's sitting right there today because the answer to the second question is he was healer I remember when I found myself in a financial bind I remember when we left this church and went to Millbrook And we thought we were going to starve to death. I closed down an air conditioning business that I had and went making really good money to making no money in one week. And we laugh and joke about it, but I can remember us. We had Bailey. She was about, what, seven, eight years old at that time. Jana was pregnant with Lexi. And I remember us sitting inside of that house in Prattville. Everybody else was going out to eat. And we were eating corn dog nuggets. And wondering how it was going to happen, what God was going to do next, how he was going to fix us. And he sent a guy. Just random people into our lives at random times. God told me to tell you that he wants me to, I want to do all the maintenance on all of your vehicles for you. So when you need tires, I want you to let me know and we'll take it up and we'll get tires. And when your vehicle needs to be serviced and when you need this and you need that. See, the answer to the second question is God showed up as provider. What's the answer to the second question for you right now? Who is he to you right now? How do you answer the question right now? If somebody asked you, who do you say he is? 
How do you answer the question today? Are you allowing the opinions of someone else that you have taken to heart and you've allowed them to formulate the opinions for you of who God is? Well, so-and-so said one time, I don't care what so-and-so said. I'm asking you that when you prayed in the midnight hour, did God show up? When you found yourself with nobody else that had an answer, did God show up and was he the answer? I want to, do, I want to say this last little part right here. God, all these things now just keep flooding my memory. I never even told you this. My mother passed away in 2017. It was just random. It was, I, was, I was at our office at the church. I get a phone call from my brother. I could tell by his voice the moment we got on the phone. He just, just out of nowhere, it just hit me. He was like, Mom, Mom just died. The shock of it in the moment just, you've all, everybody here has lost somebody. You understand that. But I was in a different position at the time. My mom and I didn't have the best relationship. I remember I remember thinking to myself Did she go to heaven? talked about church we lived hundreds of miles apart the enemy started just just bombarding my mind I went into depression when I when I tell you I've always been one of these. Depression's not real. Just just make yourself happy. There's no reason why you should not be happy. You can just make yourself be happy. I went into depression. I was riding down the interstate one day. It was it was causing problems. It was causing problems between Jana and myself, it was causing problems. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to be there. I was just the shell of a person. I didn't care about being around anybody. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't, I didn't want anybody consoling me for any reason at all. I just wanted to just live life and people just leave me alone. One day I was driving down 65 in Mobile. man the enemy was just like just pounding me and I had gotten to one of the lowest points of my life and I can remember I was passing I was coming up on this exit just a couple exits below the one that we lived off of little town called Chickasaw and as I was driving I was looking at this overpass And the enemy whispered into my ear and he said, why don't you just take this truck and just swerve over and just center that column on that overpass right there and get this thing over with. And everything in that moment wanted to just just put your foot on that gas and just center that thing.
And I prayed 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 and I asked God and I asked God and I asked God and nothing changed. I just kept fighting. I just kept fighting. I was fighting to live. I was just fighting just to get up in the mornings and I couldn't explain it. It didn't make sense to anybody for me to try to tell them what I was dealing with because I didn't even know how to explain it. We had gone one one day, we were, Jana and the girls and I, we had gone across the bay over into Baldwin County to do something, and we were driving back, and we were coming across the, the bayway, the long bridge that comes over the bay. And my phone rings, and it's my brother. This is just a few months after my mom had died. He's talking to me, just random, and he just asked me out of nowhere. He's like, how you doing, buddy? And I said, I I don't know, man. I said, I'm just struggling. He said, I can't get it out of my mind, out of my heart. I'm just so worried about what I just don't know about mom. And he says, I forgot to tell you. And I said, you forgot to tell me what? He said, you're not going to believe me in this. And My brother lives in Birmingham. And uh, he's in ministry too, a little bit different. He's not full-time or anything like that. But he, he preaches a lot and he goes and speaks at this women's center called the, the Love Lady Center in Birmingham. His wife usually goes with him, but for some reason she couldn't go. She was meeting him there. She couldn't ride with him. And he said, I was on my way to the Love Lady Center to go and preach. And he said, all of a sudden, just riding, I'm just listening to some worship music. He said, I heard mom's voice come from the back seat of my truck and in that moment I'm like you've lost your mind something's wrong with you what I'm thinking and he said Jeremy I know that you don't want to believe me and I said Joseph what it what 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 was she saying and she said he said it doesn't make sense for me to tell you what she was saying because you're not going to understand it and I said well what what was she saying and he said she she said just look at his face and I said, what does that mean? And he said, at the time, I didn't know what it meant. And I said, are you sure that you, that you heard her voice? He said, Jeremy, I turned around and looked behind me because I thought that she was sitting in the truck with me. And he said, she said it again, and then she said it again. And I said, well, what, what does it mean? And he said, so I get to the Love Lady Center to go and speak and I'm sitting there in the, in the service, and he said they, they always start off the same way. They have one of the ladies that's in, the, in this rehab center. She'll come up, and they give her a devotion to read, and they'll walk up because they don't do their own devotions. They just read one. And He said this young girl walks up to a stage, and she introduces herself to everybody, and I'm, I'm so-and-so, and I want to give tonight's devotion before we start into worship. And I just... Tonight's devotion is titled, If You'll Look at His Face. And the moment that it came out of his mouth, I felt God's hand reach down through that vehicle inside of me. You don't have to believe this because you weren't there. Reach inside of me. And whatever the enemy had planted in me, God grabbed it and he snatched it out through me. And the moment he did, I gasped. This is why your opinion of who God is doesn't matter to me. Because you weren't there when I needed God to be healer. You weren't there when I needed God to be my redeemer. 
You weren't there when I needed God to be my rescuer, when I needed him to be my freedom. When I, you've got to not let the opinions of other people determine who you think God is. So why all of this for you today? Because your opinion of God matters. Because it determines how you fight your next battle. If I remember the times that God has rescued me, when the enemy attacks again, I don't have to think about my failures. I remember when he showed up. I don't have to think about, oh, well, what about when he... No, he always showed up when he said he would. Well, what about... No, God always showed up when he said he would. No, he didn't get there the moment that I asked him to. But he's never been late. He's never showed up late. He always showed up in his timing. I want to remind you right now that no matter where you are right now in your life, God's timing is perfect. He's going to show up. When you need him to show up. Yeah, but I need him right now. God's timing is perfect. He will show up when he needs to show up. Yeah, but I need him right now. God's timing is perfect. He will show up when he needs to show up. Please do not give up right now. I don't, uh, I don't know how you guys typically close. I want you to do something for me. Would you stand up? I'm going to step down here. You mind playing something for me, Todd? It's good to see you again, by the way. God gave me a revelation of something several years ago. My favorite passage in the Old Testament is Isaiah chapter 6. I've preached it a bunch of times. Isaiah said, starting in verse 1, he said, In the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I looked and I saw the Lord. He was high and he was lifted up. He goes through and he explains a lot of things that he's noticing in that moment. And we find him telling God, you know, God, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people that are unclean and all these different things. And, but one of the things that always stood out to me and I couldn't understand is in all of this, trying to define what he was looking at he sees God sitting on a throne and his train fills the temple and there were angels or seraphims that circled around him and the Bible tells us that one cried out to another holy 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 it didn't say they said anything else holy and the whole earth is full of his glory holy he's just holy and I was reading it one day, and I thought to myself, and this it, is it, just the, the logic side of me, the, the flesh side of me. How can, how can angels that were created before really time ever began still today be circling around the same throne and still be saying the exact same word to each other over and over and over again and never stop? And I was sitting there reading it one day, and all of a sudden, God hit me with something. He said, Jeremy, every time those angels pass around me, and they get back to my face and they look me in the eyes, I show them something different about me. And they go, he's holy. 
And they continue to circle. And by the time they make their way back around to my face again and they look into my eyes, I show them something different about me. And they go, he's holy. And by the time they make their way back around again, a hundred thousand years from now, and they look me in the eyes, I'm going to show them a different side of me. And they're going to look at each other and they're going to go, did you know he was holy? (laughs) And a million years from now, when that same angel crosses and he looks me in the eyes again, I'm going to show him a different side of me. How can you show him a different side? This is me. You don't have to believe this. I'm going to give them a glimpse of what I did in your life. And they're going to look at me and they're going to go, the only way that happens for him is because he's holy. And when they cross again, I'm going to give them a glimpse of your life. And I'm going to show them what I did for you. And they're going to look at me. And then they're going to look at the other angel and they're going to go, the only way that happens is because he's holy. We serve a holy God. And no matter what you're going through right now, what you've been through, or what's coming tomorrow, He's holy. He's holy, and He's for you. He's for you today. Do you? He's for you. we fully comprehend what that means he's if God be for you who can be against you he's for you today if you're comfortable right now would you stretch your hands up to heaven father I thank you I thank you, God, that so many times you could have given up on us. God, there were so many times you could have simply just snapped your fingers. And you could have started this whole thing over again. And God, the reality of the moment is, is I really don't know why you didn't. I don't know why, God, you chose us. I don't know why you chose us to live in this moment in time right now, God, because I believe that we're living in the last days, God, and I believe that we could be the ones that get to see you return to this earth. I don't know, God, what the opinions that we've formulated in our mind today of who you are because of outside circumstances, because of struggles in our lives that we've been through, God, because of things that we've faced, things, God, that have maybe tainted the experience of who you want to be for us. But God, right now, whatever the thoughts are in the minds of your people, God, I bind them right now through the power, God, of your Holy Spirit. I come against every thought, God, that would be opposed to who you are. And God, I remind every person in this building right now that your promises are yes and amen. That you are for us and you are not against us, God. You are for us and you are not against us, God. So Father, the person in this room right now that is fighting I pray strength into them 
God, I speak your peace to those right now that are battling in their mind. God, I speak comfort for those that are are stressed out, God, that are facing the anxieties of life, God. I pray healer for those that are sick. God, I pray deliverer for those that are bound. God, you are, I am. There's nothing, God, that is too great for you. There's not a situation in our lives right now that you are sitting on the edge of your throne, wringing your hands, trying to figure out how you're going to fix it. You are the answer. God, you don't have the answer. You are the answer. God, I thank you. I thank you that I get to know the answer today. And God, I don't know if there's someone in this room right now that has allowed those situations in life, God, to come in and hinder their relationship with you. But God, I just believe and I speak right now that if someone has, Father, that God, let your love, let it capture them again. God, let them receive you again into their heart and into their life. God, I pray right now, before there's ever a revival inside of a building, God, that there would be a revival inside of our hearts. God, let there be a hunger and a thirst for you that can't be quenched by anything else except for your presence, except for your spirit, God. God, don't let us get filled up on anything else except for you. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you chose us. And God, my answer to the second question today is you are the I am. In Jesus' name. Would you give God a hand clap of praise this morning? Praise the Lord. So, got me? Check. Okay, here we go. So the first thing to be poured into your empty vessels is the answer to the second question. And I tell you, if you answer that right, your vessel won't hold it. I am whatever you need. Thank you, Jeremy, for bringing the word of the Lord to us. God bless you. Shake hands, love on each other. Don't forget service tonight, 6 o'clock. I know that's a new thing for us. Service tonight, 6 o'clock. Be sure and be here. Be here with Patrick and Tristan and Chosen Worship. Again, thank you, Jeremy, Jana, Lexi. Bailey for being here with us. Don't you love them? Give them another round of applause to let them know how much you care about them. God bless you. We love you.